Bibles he's going to hand out to all the dads in the house. So when he comes by and you're a dad, I want you to raise your hand. He's going to give you a carpenter's pencil. Who here has used a carpenter's pencil, please? Plenty of men and women. All right. So I didn't realize what all this did. I had no idea. I am not a blue-collar worker, right? So I have no idea, right? So check this out. The carpenter's pencil is a pencil with a body with rectangular or elliptical cross-section to prevent it from rolling. If you're on a roof or you're working on something, as a man or a woman can be, the carpenter would put it down and it doesn't slide. It doesn't roll like, you know, we think of a number two lead pencil in school, right, that's round for the most part even though it has edges and it rolls easily. This is not going to roll easily. They are easier to grip than a standard pencil. Think if you have a tool, you have gloves on, this is going to be easier to hold on to, okay? It's going to be easier. It has a non-rounded core, which is thick and heavy. Lines can be made. You can take this and sharpen it where it will not easily break. If any, I have no idea. I've used them just on occasions when somebody asked me to help them out, and that's pretty unusual because people know I don't do good with that. But when they ask me to help them out, I've used it, but I didn't notice how hard it is. It inherently has a very hard lead compared to the soft lead that we're used to in schools growing up. The, the lines are made for precision. You can take it with a, without a sharpener that we're used to in school. You can take a knife and sharpen it, and you can actually take a rasp or something and drag it across it, a rasp or a, a um, help me here. Even concrete. Even yes, even something concrete coarse, concrete. right? You can drag it and you can, get a, you can get a sharp point. You can actually take a file and if you're good, you can niche it in the middle, nick it in the middle, and you'll have two parallel lines. That some people utilize it for doing that. It's robust, it's heavy, it doesn't break easily, it can withstand Marking on heavy surfaces, like I said already, the lead is extremely hard. Um, it also is used to measure. I had no idea. It is one quarter inch one way and one half inch another way. So if a carpenter's working, they can use that to be their spacer as they space things out because classically in the Western world, we use quarter inch and half inch on spacing things. Um, there's so many other things I could talk about with this thing. And I didn't know it, but I wanted to give every dad one this morning, and I wanted to tell you something in line with our message today, that Habakkuk 2.2, 2, if you'll pull it up in the sound booth, I didn't put this on your notes, Habakkuk 2.2, 2, or Habakkuk, however you say it properly, I'm not sure. Habakkuk 2.2 2 says this, it says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon tablets, that he may run that reads it. And I think that's really good for dads. You've got to make it clear. You've got to make it clear what your family is meant to do, what their calling is on their lives. For every dad needs to get one of these today to take home. What do you think, Pastor? I didn't know all that either. <laughs> but I'm glad I, I'm glad I got one. <laughs> I don't think I'll be using it for all of that, but at least I can tell somebody what it can be used for. Amen? Amen. Uh, you know, Pastor Zach and I and Colton, we always get together on special occasions like this for Father's Day or Mother's Day, whatever it is that we're celebrating together. And, and you know, uh, it's just a calendar day for most people, uh, and it's a Father's Day for others. But for the body of Christ, there's, there's a difference. Because we, already, we always look at our fathers, but we think of our Heavenly Father. And we know that our relationship with our earthly fathers can affect our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The relationships that we've had, good, bad, and ugly, can affect our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And it's important for us to get a proper perspective of who He is. And there's no better place than to get that than through the Word of God, definitely in prayer, but we get that from the written Word of God, a proper perspective of who the Father is. Amen? Matthew chapter 6 uh, gives us a proper perspective as far as our priority in prayer and coming before God. 
Pastor Zach and I were talking last night, and he asked me, he said, what's the Lord been showing you? And I said, brother, I've just been hanging out in the book of Daniel for the last week or so. And it's just been ministering to me over and over again. And um, even yesterday morning, my wife and I were up having our devotion and uh, sitting out on the back patio. And and I said, let's let's look at Daniel chapter 1. And let's just go through Daniel chapter 1. And what I began to share with Pastor Zach last night was that uh, I just see uh, a man... Young men, I see a man in a young man. You know what I'm saying? He had a a, a, a very mature heart. And um, him and the three Hebrew boys that were taken into captivity, as they begin to come out of their land of Judah and come into the land of the Chaldeans, the, the land of uh, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, can you imagine what it would be like being ripped from your home and everything you know to be put into a place where you're going to live for the rest of your life. Completely foreign to you. Completely different from what you know. Completely different from your religion. Completely different from the upbringing you've had. No more moms cooking. Right? It's, it's, It's a whole new place in every perspective. And you have to ask yourself, at least Daniel had to look at himself and examine his heart. And he said, I'm not going to change on the inside. They can do what they want with me on the outside, but Father, help me not to change my heart toward you. And we know that that started with Daniel in his heart, that the word says that, but Daniel... But Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the delicacies, with the things that the king was bringing into his life. I mean, you know that you can live in a world that's dirty and still be clean. You're not clean by what you do. You're clean by his righteousness. And his righteousness only comes as a result of your receiving the gift that God has given you in the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? So, Matthew 6, verse 9. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. Jesus says, pray then like this. Here's what Jesus said. Listen, don't miss that. Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. That's the first place you go. That's priority number one. Pastor Zach said, cast a vision. And the, and the fathers are to lead. And the fathers are to lead by going here first. Our Father in heaven. That's where we're to go first. That's a priority of every father. And leading his family is to go to the Father first. That, that need to go to the Father is the thing that Jesus revealed that nobody had ever revealed to the Jewish people. Um, before I go into to connect with that, I just want to talk, say that we're here to, to give tools. If I could give a, a title to the message from my behalf, it would be Tools, Work, and Love. you got tools, but you got to know how to use the tools. And they're looking for a tool of prayer. How do we pray? How do we use this tool? And he brought to them the up front, most important thing of all is recognizing your father. He, God is father. He told them in John 17, 6, he says, I have manifested your name. This is Jesus in the high priestly prayer before he dies for us. He says to his disciples as he prays with them, he says to the father out loud, he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. He has manifested their name, God's name to them. Now, they knew God's name, right? What's God's name? I'm going to read this to you from a book that I'm reading. It says, what was the name Jesus made known to his disciples? It was not... It was not the sacred name Jehovah or Yahweh, however you correctly translate it. The Jewish people had known that name. 
they knew that name for 14 centuries before Jesus said to them, I revealed, I'm revealing your name, Father, to them. So what name is he revealing? Because they already knew the name. It was a new name, a name hinted to in the Old Testament and never openly revealed until Jesus showed up to God's people. This name was never openly revealed. That name was Father. He says, I have come to reveal to you, to them, that you are their Father. And that's what set the Jews, as in the, the Pharisees, on edge is because you cannot be God's Son. He says, I am God's Son. And these that are with me are going to be God's children too. And it just set them on edge. Webster, it says, Webster defines manifest. He said, I have manifested your name to them, is what he said in that prayer. De Webster defines manifest as to make evident or certain by showing or displaying. The word manifest is a strong word. It means to show or to display. Jesus did not merely offer his disciples a theological, theological definition of God. He manifested God as Father by the way he lived out his life before them. A life of unbroken fellowship with and total dependence upon God. They had never seen anyone live a life like that. In John 14, 6, speaking of his purpose and coming to earth, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. These words suggest a question. If Jesus is the way, what's he the way to? A way is never complete by itself. It predisposes a destination. Right? He pre it predisposes a destination. What then is the destination? The closing words of that verse tell us, No one comes to the Father except by me. I am the way to the Father. I am the way of the Father. We talk a great deal. This is the last thing, and this is by Derek Prince in the book Husbands and Fathers, which is just, I want to do a study with men so bad on this because it's dripped. Bless my heart, man. He, this is the last thing I'm going to read to you. We talk a great deal about the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, our intercessor, our mediator, and so on. All this is wonderful, but it stops short of Jesus' ultimate purpose to bring us to the Father, to bring us to our Father. I think that's so good. Romans 8, verse 28, we read this all the time. It says, and we know that all things work together. We quote this in the church quite a bit, right? Who's not familiar with this in the church, right? So we know this. Check this out. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Verse 29 for whom he did foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, the Lord Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Right in line with that prayer. That we can be like Jesus, a born-again child of God. And verse 30, just as the capstone, man, it's just the top. Moreover, whom he did predestine, he also called. Who he called, he also justified. Who he justified, he also glorified. We are glorified in Christ. We're not there yet. But it's good as done, amen, for what Jesus has done. Wow. You know, you get your identity as a believer from your relationship with the Father. That's where we get our identity from. Your identity is not found in your calling. It's not found in your gifts. It's not found in the place you go to church. It's not found in any of those things. Your identity is found in in your father amen it's in your relationship with him and you can have a biological father and never have a physical relationship with him where you know them where you engage with him where you talk with him and you still have features that look like him you still have mannerisms that come up that's just a part of your DNA. You don't know why you do it. It's just, it's just part of your identity. You have nothing to say about those things. That's just built in you. When you become a believer and you go from darkness into light, there are things that change in your life that you don't even realize. When people see you, they see him. They see his presence. The closer you are in a relationship with your father on earth, the more you pick up on those things. That's right. 
the more you learn about those things. It, you, it's not even that you're learning them. It's just like they're just coming off on you. Amen? Amen. You, 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 you see people say, boy, you look just like your daddy. You act, Man, I'm telling you right now, you look just like your father. And the truth of the matter is, is that those things begin to come into our lives as a result of our relationship as a result of being around them and following them and being led by them. I told Pastor Zach last night, I said, the problem that most fathers get into or have, I should say, is that they mature, their children are maturing, and they become competitive with their kids rather than continuing to stay in a place of leadership. And they get competitive with their young men because their men are growing up Physically, to a place where they want to challenge dad. Challenging physically, they wrestle with him. Challenging physically, they play ball. Dad, I'm going to beat you this time, right? I'm going to out-muscle you this time. I'm going to out-strength you this time. And if a father isn't confident in who he is and secure in who he is before he is before, before God, before he's before his child, he can fall easily into a competition and he can hurt the heart of his child because he's more concerned about beating him than he is about leading him. You see, there's a difference. There's a difference between leading your sons than defeating your sons. We can get to a place in our lives. If we're, not, if we're not careful, and we're not, we're not looking at the Father and see his, and see his heart towards better, a better example than to see, to see the prodigal, the prodigal son. son. Yeah, so that, 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 well, that's what I was talking about. about this prodigal. The son who came back home with no greater example than when the father ran to that son and he fell on his neck and the mud began to hug him. Because, because the story, the story is not, was not just, just about, about, about it was not it was not only, only about the boys, but it was about the heart of the heart of the father leaving these boys, boys, and that he did that not he bring kind of condemnation on, on the, son the son that was away, that was away. but yet he came back, back, back with his loving, loving arms. arms. There was no condemnation there. there. There was no condemnation to say you were wrong, wrong. Only that you're back and I'm willing to embrace you. That's the heart of the father. And that's what's and that's hard, what's is, hard is, is having the heart. heart. And that's what and we that's always what we all do. We want to have the heart that's right. right. And, and we've been studying in Ephesians on Wednesday nights. And if you'll bring up in the sound booth, six, six, Ephesians 6, 4, four. Um, this, um, this really, really leaped out to me. Out to me. And, and, and it really challenged, it challenged me. me. It says, and fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And this is in line with what you're It's It's not about, not about how many of us want, I'm a father now with teenagers. So I want them to do things my way, not just a way, but my way. Because my way looks to, yeah, it's the best way, right? I mean, and now I've got, a, you know, a son who's talking about, well, I don't want to go, I, wanna, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, you, you're my kid. You mean you don't want to do that? How can, how can this be? But it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But what's it say? But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Amen. All we can do is rear them and discipline them and love them in the Lord and what the Lord tells us to do. And we cannot control them any greater than that. That's good. We can't force them to have another way. We can't force them to live out what we want them to live out. But we are to bring them up in the fear, or the, excuse me, the training and admonition, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. How do we do that? Teach them the word. I've got a fence problem in my backyard, and some screws have come loose from the post there, and I need to screw that back, get those screws back in there. Some people try to do screws with that, too. And I think this will do it, right? You mean a nail? I think I can get the screws. No, the screws. I think I can screw that back in, you know, with 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 this... You know, I, I can want to get that back in, those screws back in, but if I do force those screws back in with this, it's not going to hold. It's not going to hold. Right? Why? 
It's not the right tool. Right. It's obvious to everyone now, right? It's not the right tool. How many of you have ever tried to fix something with the wrong tool? How many of you have taken the All shoe the off and let me give me that boot over there and let me hang, put this nail in the wall, right? And it is frustrating that, you, that you're using the wrong tool. You know, I, I need to go out and take my batter off my car. Got my old trusty hammer, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not going to do the job. Here's, the, here's what Pastor Zach is saying in a nutshell, and that is when we raise our children up in the way that they should go, and when they grow older, they mature, they won't depart from it. What we need to do is we'll give them the right tool with the right instructions. We'll give them the right tool for the right purpose. And we say this is used in a multiplicity of ways, right? And that's one of my big words today, multiplicity. We, this can be used in a number of ways, but you can't use it for this. You can, but it's not going to work the way it should work, Right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for. We teach our sons that, but we show them by loving our wives and laying our lives down. Amen? Like Christ laid down his life for the church. We lead by example and we give them the tools that they need, the spiritual tools. We can't give them all the tools for life. We don't know what they're going to encounter in this life. But what we can give them is the essential things of the word. And we, we can equip them so they're not trying to mow their yard with a ladder. Right. Amen? We laugh, but we've seen the not nonsense, right? We've seen that nonsense in people's lives when they're trying to do things and you're sitting over there, Leonard, with your white hair on your face going, nope, <laughs> that's not going to work. What you need is wisdom. And what you need is a father in your life to bring that wisdom to you. Amen? So it starts where Pastor Zach is talking about right there. Well, and Pastor, what people don't understand, especially when fathers, because I think a lot of fathers feel like failures because their family's not, they haven't done what they're supposed to do. And, and we see women thank God for the moms that lead spiritually when the dads don't. And then a dad looks at a situation. And one of the things we want to share with you today is we believe God can do it. If we look at a situation, we go, I haven't, I haven't been the spiritual father in my home. I haven't been what I, I don't, I, I really don't even know if I know how to pray. I don't know how to do these things. So we watch a woman, thank God for the woman, try to do what God said to do. But it's the same manner as what you're saying. You can drive that nail in. I'm, I'm sorry, screw in with a hammer. <laughs> but it's not going to work well. And it, I've seen it work halfway. I've seen it do some good. But when a man steps into a position with faith, and he begins to lead his family. What a woman has spent years trying to do, I have seen men do in months. Amen. Why? Because it's the right tool for the right job. Amen. It's anointed and what God said for it to be when a man begins to do what he's supposed to do in his family. And he doesn't have to know it all. That's right. He doesn't have to have it all figured out. But as he can, I love the testimony of my brother Leonard, who has been in this church since I come along and has showed me that being faithful to God is where it's at. And you don't have to have it all figured out. Amen? His testimony over and over again of God's faithfulness and just showing up and trying and trying to do what God says. And that's what fathers need to do. This is a command to the fathers, not to the wives. Fathers, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Well, as we were buying these awesome things we're going to give away, by the way, for the amount of men here, you got about a 50% chance of getting a really big gift. So I think that's cool. <laughs> so... So I was thinking about, you know, these gifts are quite different. One gift, the tall ladder, is able is what we want to tell you is we give you a gift. We're here to gift men. We're here to challenge men today. We're here to honor men, but we're here to challenge them. The ladders, think of it, where you can reach things in your lives. Here, we at the church are trying to help you reach things in your life that is way out of reach and way up in the corner and full of cobwebs. Or we're here to give you a lawnmower if your business is in front of everybody and it's out of control and growing. And everybody in, the, in their neighborhood knows how bad your problems are and they're knee high. We're here to give you that too. We're here to give you whatever tool you need, whether it be way up out of reach and forgotten or anybody relate to this when you can't mow your lawns, dads, and some of your moms, and it gets out of control. Brother John over there, he's like, can I borrow a lawnmower last week? He's been working like crazy. So, 
When things are out of control, that's what we're here for as a church. We're here to help equip you. We're here to show you that God can do it. Amen? That's good. I, I just sitting here thinking, and uh, uh, I was out mowing my lawn yesterday, and my neighbor uh, was out pushing the lawn, and my neighbor says, you can use my, my rider, you know, zero turn radius if you want to. I looked at my lawn morning. I looked over at his. I looked at my lawnmower and I looked at what, what was standing right between me and my lawnmower. <laughs> and I said, nope. I need to push this one. <laughs> I need to push it out. And, and, and met my step goals yesterday. Surpassed them. My watch was just buzzing big old hearts at me. Good job. Keep it up. And I was like, pushing that lawnmower. But you know, uh, The one thing that keeps us, that keeps many men from being the fathers that they're called to be, and I said this last week and I'll say it again, is that they are afraid to be vulnerable before their their family, before their children. Most importantly, they're afraid to be vulnerable before, before God. Because you can't give what you don't have. And if you're not vulnerable before the Lord in that time of prayer and you pour out your heart, and you and you if you can't come to the Lord to the Lord in humility and say, I don't have what it takes. I can't do this on my own. Yeah. I need your help. Mm-hmm. I, I can I can macho up and I can put on the father, you know, vest and the name tag and try to be a father and gather everything that I know about being a father and try to put my own stuff in it. Yeah. Or I can just give up and say, Lord, you're going to have to, Father, my Father in heaven, teach me how to be the Father that you want me to be. I've had some great examples, but you're the best example. Amen. And I cannot give what I don't have. You know what the Word says in 1 John 4, 18? It says, there is no fear in love. What is God? Love. Say it again. Love. God is love. And there's no fear in him. So when you go to the Father and you present yourself to the Father in humility, you can know that there's no fear in him. There's no fear in you because perfect love, his perfect love, will cast out all fear. It will cast out all inhibitions. It will cast out the reluctancy that we, many men, have to be vulnerable before our kids. There's a reason why Joseph loved his second to the youngest. I'm Joseph. Jacob, Israel, loved Joseph like he loved him. If you read the first scripture, it says he was the son of his older years or his latter years simply means that he had been through some things that simply caused him to look at his son in a completely different way than he did previously to his other boys. Does it mean he loved them less? I don't believe that. I believe he had an understanding of love deeper for this son than he had previously. Many of us, I'm getting a chance to start over with girls. I've got four adult kids and I have four little kids, and I'm getting, chan- I'm seeing some things in my response to them that has that wasn't like that with my response with them. Why? Because it was a trial. <laughs> I was being tested. I was going through some things, and and a lot of times I wasn't crying out, "Lord, help me." I was just kind of winging it. Mm-hmm. But now I've come around. Grandpas know this really well. Uh, I can I can put into them what I winged in you. (laughs) I winged it out on you. Now I can pour into them what I got from God and I know this works. I know this will work and I can love you without fear. Amen. Amen. Well, that rawness, that realness, that love, when I think my dad sitting back there in the back, the phrase I remember as a kid when I would see him coming and going is, what are you working on? What are you working on? What are you doing? But you know what? That what my memory, my memory of my in my childhood that I'll always carry with me, Pastor, is when he showed me his heart in a few moments 
whether it be an apology or whether it be a heartfelt, meaningful thing, those are what hang with you. That's what hangs with you and fills up your heart to get you through that no matter what mistakes we've made along the way, no matter what mistakes and what he's done right or wrong, when you see their heart, I had another friend in Christ tell me recently of talking about his father-in-law who had a lot of issues. But when his father-in-law was the man in the family, when everything could be crazy, this individual was the one that loved people like no one else. Then all of a sudden this, this father or this father-in-law's error became so much smaller. It became irrelevant because he saw his heart. And that's what Jesus came to do is to reveal to us the heart of the Father. That's what he came to reveal because that's what's going to get us through it all. When we know that we're loved and we know that we can stand on this scripture, whatever's going on, all things work to the good of those who love God. How can we claim that? Because it says that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. And that means that we could have to suffer. I mean, Jesus had to suffer. Christianity today says no idea. We don't talk about suffering in Christianity. In America, we don't. I don't know about other parts, but we don't like that idea. But if our Lord Jesus had to suffer to fulfill the destiny he had for the kingdom, we may have to do some suffering, right? But what's going to happen in the end is what it says in verse 30 of chapter 8. We're going to go through justification and ultimately be glorified with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. I, I thought I just now I'm thinking about this um, this morning uh, when I got ready to leave the house, uh, my wife's car was parked behind mine. I was under the carport there, and uh, my daughter came out to move the car, and um, my little four-year-old come running out behind her, and I was getting into the jeep, and she was getting into her mom's car. And out in the middle between our cars was Amani. <clears throat> and I just happened to catch her out of the corner of my eye as I was getting opening my door to get in my car. And my daughter didn't see her at all. And I turned around and I, I closed my door and I grabbed her and I walked her back toward the front door and I said, you cannot run out here in this driveway like that. If you want me, yell daddy, but don't come to the driveway behind me and I don't know you're behind me because you could get run over and it would hurt my heart so bad. It would hurt us so bad to have that accident happen. And inside of my heart, I'm shaking. I'm trembling because I'm thinking in my heart and my head, you know, you know, everyone knows the worst and I'm, and I'm looking at her, and she has no idea. She's completely oblivious to what could have happened in a split second. God loves us so much. And he's beckoning us. And he's calling us. And he's trying to show us what can happen in a split second. If we run into danger, if we run into places that we don't even know there's da- the dangers exist. It's just my yard. It's just my dad. It's just my sister. It's just whatever it is. He wants to protect you. That is our Father's heart. That He wants to protect us. And the Word of God says in Ephesians 1, He says, He has blessed us. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's provided to us with every spiritual blessing. Pull up Ephesians 1. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. His power to create the heaven and to choose us before the foundations of the world. Verse 4 even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption unto himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glory, grace, glorious grace, 
with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God's desire is to protect us. And how does he do that? He's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. It's, a, it's up to us to embrace that. My little Amani may not fully understood that this morning, but she saw something in me that said, I want to protect you. My Angelo has the quote, but I'm sure you can find it in the Word, and it simply says this. You may not remember a person's name, but you will always remember how they made you feel. Our Father, we know his name, but more importantly, he wants to protect us and he wants to keep us. And we will always know how he makes us feel when we run to him and we yield to him and we humble ourselves to receive what he has for us. As a man who has tools in hand and fills out a place, I, I read the word and I fill out a place. I just feel like I haven't done what I'm supposed to. I just feel like I haven't been the dad I'm supposed to be. And, and I think of how they asked Jesus, the greatest tool we have is prayer. And they said, how do we pray? And the first thing he says is, Father, recognize him as your father. Total dependency upon him, our father. Because like you said, Pastor, there's things we don't know. We don't know why we're at, where we're at, how, why are we here and where are these things? There's so many things over our head that we have no idea. But our Heavenly Father has a plan. He has a purpose and a plan for everything. And if we stay close to Him, you know, if I could title this, I would say tools, work, and love. Love is the greatest. Love will accomplish so much more. The times, the memories I have, and it would take me a long time to tell you the memories I have of, when, of my family, of my dad. But when he tells me in those moments that he's sorry for what happened and I see his heart, that's life-changing. That's life-changing. That's life-changing. That changes lives. And when we think as men about these tools that we're going to have you guys come up here, we're about to draw for our, uh, for our big gifts, and we want every dad to come by and grab a tool, we want you to know that God is going to have to train you. You have to submit because a tool in this hand is pretty worthless. But if these hands will be trained how to use it, it's a totally different manner. It's a totally different thing whenever I'm trained to use it. So you've got to train. And that's why men are supposed to be in the church and in fellowship and in, with their family and together. is Because we can't do what we're called to do as Lone Rangers like the pastor was saying. All of us have Lone Ranger memories. We all of us get away. And this walk is about being broken and being right where God wants us to be. And that means that we need each other, man. Fathers need each other. We need to be together. Amen. Did Rick Sand get another one of these hard hats? These quote-unquote hard hats? Brother Leonard, will you come up and take these and take the dads? Every dad still got their um, paper? Sweet. You need a paper? All right. He was on the praise and worship, so he wasn't given one. Sorry, Dan. Don't, don't leave Dan now. No, he's a dad. <laughs> you know, I was just as we get the, everyone those papers, I was just thinking, and Pastor Zach had sent me a text, uh, oh, a few weeks ago, and he was considering what we were going to do on Father's Day and looking at stuff to give away. And... Uh, Thank you, Tom. And looking at these ladders, you know, has, when's the last time you've been on a ladder? Recently? A long time? I'm looking at Connie over here. Connie said, you should have gave some of these gifts out on Mother's Day. <laughs> right. She told me that early. She said, we could have used a lot more. <laughs> but uh, I was up on a ladder yesterday fixing some of the stuff that the wind had done to my house. And, you know, you can go up a couple of steps and feel pretty comfortable, right? But once you start getting to the halfway point and you know you still got 
you ain't where you're supposed to be yet, and you still got some places to go. You want to say, uh, someone come out here and hold this. Spot, look at me, watch me, do something, right? In case what? <laughs> in case I fall. Now, I don't want to fall, but just in case I'm up here and it gets a little wobbly, I'm going to tell you, hey, I'm about to come down. Either by my own steps or because I'm, I'm tumbling down. But here's the point that I'm making. God wants to take us to great heights, men. He wants to take us to places that we can't reach in and of ourselves. And he's provided a ladder for us to get there. But he's also provided someone that can hold us accountable, someone that can be alongside of us. That's what Pastor Zach is saying, that we can't do it alone. We need each other. And who can identify better with a father than another father? Right? And so uh, we need to have each other in our lives so that we can be there to support each other and to say, you got the next step. I got you. Go ahead and get up there. You're, you're on solid ground. And you can get up there. And you can get the work accomplished that you're called to do. Amen? Makes sense? Amen. Okay, so the lawnmowers and the ladders are from Lowe's. If you have a problem, if you're getting a lawnmower, um, it's got the oil and manual and everything in the bag, okay? And this is for visitor or guest? I mean, or home? You pick, Pastor. Okay. Let's let's call this one a visitor one. Okay. And I'm going to call on the, 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 the carpenter in our church. There you go. For which one, though? For Look, ladder that, or lawnmower? For, for, I'm, uh, for the, uh, let's do the ladder. Mr. Ware here. To reach in here. The and, man over and, the building. And, He's the one who makes all decisions for us when it comes to, you can't put that nail there. <laughs> John Morris. Sweet. I should have said Lon Morris, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, man, hey, you, hey, stick around. You might, somebody might need the ladder and you might need the lawnmower. Amen? All right. Now we're drawn for the ladder for the guests, right? What if we don't get a guest? I think they're all, yeah, they are mixed together. Well, we got the home. Well, that was the guest, right? Okay. Well, it's a guest. Well, thank you, Desi. She's always keeps me. It's a guest. Keeps, keeps me straight. Dwight Richie. Oh man. There you go. Worked out good. All right, two ladders. All right. All right, here we go. These ladders are awesome. Here we way. go. Looking for a. Well, the, the Lord is awesome, one. but they're good. For the lawnmower. Here we go. Thomas. Kakumeli. Thomas, all right. There you go. All right, here we go. We're going to pull until we pull a guest name, right? Well, we got one. Donnell Hayes, Jr. Whoa! Here you go, buddy. Sweet. Are you drawing for anything else? No, sir. Okay. No, but we're going to have root beer up here, and we're going to have tools, and we're going to pray, but we're going to require every dad to come up and get their tool and get their root beer and get a hug. So we can Amen. pray with you. Amen. 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 Go, Go ahead, Pastor. Pastor. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pastor. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we pray that today is a day of honoring dads, but also a day, Father, for us to be instructed by your word that no dad is perfect on this earth. We have all failed, are going to fail again, Lord, but we know from the teaching of our Lord Jesus that you are our Father. Therefore, we can come to you. And it says before that, not to be repetitious in that teaching in Matthew. Jesus said, don't be repetitious like the heathens who just think they're going to get somewhere with the random words. Just come to your father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask is what the verse says in front of that. Thank you, Father, that you know all things. And all we have to do is come to you as children. And we ask you to help fathers to serve you, to be close to you, to be the dads and the husbands that they're called to be, Lord God. We pray that today's a blessing for dads, that everything works out for them to get closer and closer to you. And that here at Oasis, we will become a place of strong fathers. Because if we have strong fathers, we have fathers and husbands, then we have the whole family. So we ask you, Father, to bless the men from the top down because the blessings go from the top downward. Bless them, Father. And let we bless your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Yes, sir, go ahead. I feel the need to share this and say this. I, I, my wife, my family, we live in Oklahoma City, and um, we have for the last 
24 years. And I'm originally from Watonga, if you guys don't know. And I, and I have a brother in this church, if you guys don't know. Right there. So, uh, and friends as well in this church as well. But I want to say this. I want to say this to Dwayne and, and, and Zach, Pastor Dwayne and Pastor Zach. I, I go to a church that has uh, four campuses, and uh, including a five. We're in the Mabel Bassett also uh, women's facility in Oklahoma City. Um, we have a large church, and we, we, we see a lot of people. I'm on the praise and worship team. I'm on, uh, I help with a ministry to couples, my wife and I do. My, my kids serve um, in, some, in some capacity of music or, or serving in, in some area of the church. So we're very involved with our church in Oklahoma City. But I want to say this, that we've had guests come from that you may have seen on TV, We've had guests from all over the United States and outside of the United States come to our church and share. And I want to say that the level of teaching and the level of ministry that you're getting from these two, young, these two men are on the same level as that teaching. And that those people who come from far and wide to our, to our church that travel all over the world. And the Bible tells us that often that a prophet is without honor in their own hometown. And that's not because you don't honor them. That's just because we grow complacent. We get used to what we have. And, 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 and I'm not trying to compare them to anyone, but I want you to know that these guys are awesome. God is working through them. They are an ebb and flow of a, a conduit of what God wants to minister in this place and could be used in any other capacity around the world. And, 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 and I want you guys to, to realize that, and I want to honor them this morning by saying, men, you've done an awesome job. God bless you guys. Thank you. That was an honor. Thank you, brother, for sharing that. Well, you all are dismissed. We love you. We just ask for the dads to come up here, claim your gifts, get your tools, get a beer, get a hug. Amen. <laughs>